2002. And so, in a lot of ways, um, this has kind of become, you know, sort of a regular and fairly important uh, part of my calendar every year. And, uh, in fact, it's far from the first time that my birthday has overlapped. In fact, uh, a year <coughs> that uh, I will probably never forget, in 2003, uh, for lots of reasons, in Perth, um, we actually had the banquet, and the keynote that I gave was on my birthday. So LCA and my birthday all get tangled up, and uh, thank you very much for recognizing that this morning. Um, before we jump into the Q&A, though, um, this week, as I've talked to people, I've realized that there uh, are a couple of you know, loops that I should try to close. Um, first of all, uh, for those of you who were uh, at LCA last year, how many of you sat in on the talk that I gave or have watched the video since? Um, I'm really pleased to report that a year makes a heck of a difference. And <clears throat> we're able to move into the new house built on our property at the end of September, and uh, the dust is literally starting to settle, as is snow. It's that time of year in Colorado. Uh, also, earlier this week, my good friend Evan Moglin uh, was asked about the status of Freedom Box and had this to say. Um, I'm pleased to report that uh, trading a little sleep for other things last night, um, I can tell you that... <laughs> and to just be abundantly clear about this, the only contribution I've made to the Freedom Box 0.3 release, other than talking about it this morning, is one package upload to Debian a couple of days ago since I arrived at LCA. Uh, there are folks like Sunil Mohan and Nick Daly and Petter Reinholtzen who have been carrying the torch over the last year or so, and uh, I'm really appreciative of that. Um, you know, go take a look at this. There's still lots of things to do. If this is a project that you're interested in and would like to help with, I'm sure they'd still love to have your help. So, enough about those sorts of things and me and all of that. Well, maybe not quite. Um, this is not the first time that I have shared the stage at LCA with these folks. Um, <laughs> given the little you know, ticket selling thing this morning, um, if my beard is worth on the order of $40,000 Australian, a 3D printer's got to be worth something more than that. <laughs> But in fact, if we go all the way back to 2003, part of the reason that year is so significant to me is that at that LCA, um, Linus and Tridge and I were asked to do something that hadn't been done until then at an LCA, which was to just take questions from the audience for a while. And I have said to the organizer several times since that that's one of my personal favorite sessions at an LCA ever. And part of the reason for that is that I actually like taking questions from people, and I like having some sense of what other people want to hear about, as opposed to just standing and talking for a really long time. Uh, the other part was I think that was actually the first time that Linus and I, or Tridge and I, or indeed the three of us all together had actually shared a stage, and uh, that has sort of set the stage, if you will, for lots of things that have happened since. Of course, um, there's some people who just couldn't leave well enough alone. <coughs> <laughs> I think within two questions? Yeah, so that's my, my cue there. So um, I was reviewing the audio from 2003, which um, uh, how many of you here were at the 2003 Q&A? Oh, fantastic, great. So um, can anyone remember um, you know, who interjected in the first two questions? Rusty. Rusty, right. So the first two he interjected and then we realized that it was inevitable and uh, we called him down to the front uh, to join the panel. And we thought we might as well just short circuit that now because. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Rusty. You notice we already set up the fourth chair ready for you. And, uh... <laughs> So the other thing we had at the 2003 event was we had um, Chupa Chups. And so there will be, again, Chupa Chup rewards uh, for questions. So if you uh, want a Chupa Chup, you have to ask a question. And um, 
Uh, <laughs> that also happened in 2003. Uh, <laughs> oh, that was Linus that tried to grab one at the beginning, and we told him that he had to earn it first. So you'll get one at the end, Linus. Uh, right, so um, shall we start off then? Uh, any more photos, Peter? No, that was all for the photos, but um, we yeah. did also have an audio recording of the session from 2003. And oh. Tridge, I think you thought there were a couple of questions from that that might be worth revisiting. Yes, indeed. So we had a, we had a few questions. So how, did you, how many of you actually listened to the link that I sent out to the chat list, uh, the audio? Right. So there was, a, there was a few pertinent questions, I think, that uh, deserve an, an updated answer. Uh, from you know, 12 years later to see um, how it's going. So um, the first question uh, that was asked um, was, uh, when is 2.6 going to be released? <laughs> so do you remember when 2.6 was released? I have no idea. This is why I have source control these days. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, and there was a, a, a follow-up question, which, um, you know, is 2.5 ready for users to try yet? And I think we need an update on that. Do you think 2.5 is ready for users? Uh, that was such a huge disaster that we changed the whole development model. So, I, I, yeah. I think so that's a no? That is no. That's a no. Right. Okay. So, there was a couple of other questions that I, I thought were worth, um, worth revisiting. Um, one was about uh, trusted computing and signed code. And so a member of the audience asked about what Linus thought about trusted computing and signed code. And so just, just to you know, uh, give you a, uh, sort of what you answered at the time, you said that you had asked a vendor if there is an actual use case for a signed kernel. And the answer was no. And you thought it was just marketing. Um, so would you like to update that answer? Uh, so these days we obviously do it even without vendors asking for it. Um, we use it internally, and I use it internally, for example, for signing all my modules. And uh, I think it's a great use, especially the way I do it, which is to generate random keys that you throw away after you've generated the modules, which means that nobody can ever try to insert anything in your kernel. So it's a great security measure. It can obviously and I think that's something I've said for a long time, although I have no idea what I said 12 years ago, is that uh, a lot of these security measures that are vilified in this community are actually can be very useful. And uh, sometimes they have really good reasons for being used, even if some people tend to hate them intensely. But, but things have clearly changed. We, we do use it ourselves, and I use it personally all the time. Right. So the final question I think is worth reprising from the 2003 um, event was about IPv6. Um, and <laughs> at the time, if you recall, your answer was that IPv4 is good enough for most people because you don't want to give your shoe an IP address. And uh, so... <laughs> You also said that IPv6 is a decade away. Uh, now, 12 years later... It's probably less than a decade away, and most people here probably use it on your cell phones. I don't actually know how the New Zealand telcos work. It turns out, I mean, IPv4 clearly is still majorly useful, and, uh, and while IPv6 now works, I'd give it at least a decade before. <laughs> IPv4 is actually gone, if ever. We'll yeah, see. It's, uh, I always thought that IPv6 was way over-designed and uh, it made it more complicated and more painful than it needed to be. Um, and uh, private networks and things like that means that not everybody needs to use a public IP address anyway, and a lot of people do for no good reason. So your shoes, if they do want an IP address, maybe they could use one of your private network IP addresses and you could still use your shoes with IPv4. <laughs> So 
So I think they're the, the key relevant questions from 2003. So um, you may have noticed I sent out an email to the chat list yesterday asking for people to think up good questions for today's session. And so uh, how many people have got questions for today's session? A few people? All right. So we'd like you to come down and uh, stand in front of the microphone down here uh, to ask the question. And um, uh, if there's any applause at all, you know, at the end of answering your question, you get a chup a chup. Uh, so um, first person. Come, please come down to the front and uh, ask a question. Yep. Check. So sort of come down, you can go either Check. around the back or up the front if you want to, just and, and queue up in front of the microphone here. Morning. So Linus, nice yes. easy question to start with. Uh, <laughs> Over the years, various people, including myself, have either reduced their involvement in the kernel community or stepped away from it entirely due to the tone on LKML and especially your contribution to that. Why do you continue to argue that being really unpleasant to people is a good leadership strategy? Um, part of it. It's a fair question. That's not actually my real argument. Um, my real argument is that people are different, and I'm a really unpleasant person. I mean, that's what it really boils down to, is that and some people think I'm nice, and, uh, and some people are then shocked when they learn differently. Uh, and I'm not a nice person, and I don't care about you. Really, seriously. <laughs> um, I, I, care about, I care about the technology, and I care about the kernel, and uh, I really think that a lot of projects in the open source community sometimes care about non-technical things too much. And, and the reason I say that is that the only thing we can actually agree on, ever, tend to be technical issues. And if we start making a big deal about non-technical issues that are important, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they're not important, I'm saying that whenever we start making non-technical issues the primary issues, that just guarantees we'll never agree, right? Um, and um, I'm not trying to really make excuses. I'm more trying to explain that this is where I come from. And, and I appreciate the diversity in open source. But to me, that diversity is not about gender. It's not about skin color. It's about people are different. And people are different in what they are interested in. People are different in what they're good at. Uh, skin coloring, gender, and all these issues that get brought up as really important things, those are details. Uh, what is great about open source is that some people are unpleasant, but they're technically really good. Right? Some people are pleasant and like bringing other people in. And, uh, and I think that's one of maybe the most important part about open source is that you can do what you're good at. So when you look at bringing in minorities, bringing in females, bringing in people who don't speak English, my argument has been and is that we should look for people who are good at being the people who can be between other people, right? Um, there are lots of good kernel developers who are great at working with people. And they may not even be great technically. And that doesn't matter because we all have strengths, right? And this is my argument. And I refuse to change. Well, no. That sounds bad. It's not, quite true. Uh, that's, <laughs> it's, it's not that I refuse to change. It's that I don't think I want to try to bow down to what other people think. My personal personality is pretty abrasive. I love arguing. Uh, at Beering at the Museum of Technology, I was I spent the whole time just arguing with people. Right. I mean, and, and if you're that kind of personality. When you are on LKML, you will argue. And I know there are other kernel developers that are like me. And I know there are other kernel developers who are not like me. And that's all wonderful. 
And that was a really long answer to a really simple question, but the fact is, um, that's how I feel. So, um, please introduce yourself at the start of the question, thank you. Good morning. My name is Tommy Richards, and uh, Matthew, you kind of stole my question. <laughs> um, well, maybe I can... Uh, I don't work in kernel development. I'm not subscribed to the Linux kernel mailing list, but I am in the community, and I've noticed a worrying trend, which is that over the last year, there's been more hate, there's been more abuse, more vitriol in IRC, on mailing lists, on Google+. And speaking as a professional, this really concerns me because I love my job, I want to love it in 20 years' time, but if this trend continues, I will not be in the industry in, in 20 years' time. So I'd like to know, Linus has already answered, but maybe the, the other three of you could maybe tell us, you all have a lot of influence in this room and in the wider community. Do you have any plans to try and improve the community for the better for the rest of us? So I, I think we have other people who want to answer that. I'll keep this quick. I think basically what you're saying is not actually true. Um, I think the uh, tone on LKML, I don't know about IRC. Maybe people in IRC are bastards and really it's nasty. <laughs> LKML I think has been getting better. What has happened is that there's a lot of system D. Uh, oh. <laughs> There's a, there's a lot more talk, and it's become a thing that is a newsworthy. So um, I actually think LKML has, in many ways, <coughs> calmed down. And then people try to make a big deal out of it and, and, and make news out of behavior that is not different. But disagreement? So, uh, you know, um, Rusty mentioned system D. Um, those of you who have been paying attention will realize that um, I don't know, my life and that of Keith and various other folks who are here got really tangled up in this whole uh, init system debate, and it really came to a head in the Debian community uh, in the last year, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, the interesting thing about that community is that, yes, we ended up in a situation where we had a question that was partially technical and partially not so technical, and emotions ended up running immensely hot, particularly for some of the, the core participants in that debate slash discussion process. And, you know, um, emotions got hot to the uh, borderline nuclear level for a little while, and it was immensely uncomfortable. Um, as, you know, one of the folks on the wrong end of some of the vitriol around that, um, uncomfortable, I I'm being polite. Um, because you are sort of all my extended family here and I won't say things to you that I might say to other folks. But um, the really intriguing thing is all of that vitriol represents what I have described before as the vocal minority. And we do have a problem in the entire free software world where sometimes we are too willing to let the vocal minority represent us and to sort of set the tone or the agenda for some of the discussions. I'm here to tell you that in the Debian community in particular, the community is strong, the community is healthy, the community is recovering brilliantly from that whole ruckus around the init system debate. Um, work is progressing, the next stable release is coming along pretty much on schedule, uh, if you got a little extra time, go help us chase down the remaining set of release critical bugs. And at the end of the day, um, part of what I think Linus might be trying to sort of get at around the edge a little bit is it's okay for us to have uh, times where we all let our passions overflow and get in trouble with each other on sort of a personal interaction and communication basis, as long as at the end of the day we somehow figure out how to make things right uh, with all the folks that matter in the communities that we're working in. And I really hope that if nothing else, all of us here today can go forward into 2015 conscious of the fact that a lot of what we read and a lot of what gets amplified in the press and on blog posts and all of that sort of stuff is the opinion of the vocal minority. 
and many of us who would like to be in the silent majority are still just fine, everything's good, we're going to do what we can to support the friends and diverse friends around us, um, and let's not get so distracted by all of this if we can help it. Um, that's the thing that would help me to feel better about some of the stuff we've had to deal with over the last while. And I have to agree with Linus. I think we have to be very, very careful not to assume that the amount of noise we see in the press and elsewhere is truly indicative of what it's like to be part of most of the open source development communities that we know of. Yeah, so um, as someone completely outside the system D debate, I haven't seen any escalation in verbal, but, you know, the, the trend has been pretty much downhill, I think, for the last at least five years, right? And by downhill, he means better. Better, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. It, and I, and I, I do think we ought to give a shout out. There have been, there have been uh, important folks in our community who have been doing really great things uh, because it's what they're good at to try and help improve uh, our openness to diversity candidates. I'm really pleased by the diversity sponsorship at this and other recent LCAs and the fact that that's brought some interesting uh, people into the LCA community. A shout out to Karen Sandler and the other folks involved uh, in the outreach program for women. That has generated some really interesting uh, new folks in the community who've done really useful technical work and are getting jobs on the basis of that and all those sorts of things. We've seen the same thing, you know, we've seen a number of projects making concrete efforts to try and increase their uh, openness to contributions from different and diverse folks. It's not that there isn't a problem out there somewhere. I think we just have to be careful about focusing on what the problem actually is. and recognize and reward when things move in the right direction instead of spending so much time pointing fingers when somebody gets emotional. Yeah. Now. Chop a chop. <laughs> there you go. Hi. Next question. Hi, Hi I'm Yaku. Uh, so is it the year of the Linux desktop yet? <laughs> so I, I should interject there, we did have that question in 2003 and Rusty, you actually answered that. Um, and your answer was that by the end of 2004 it would be 50% Linux desktop in the world. So um, how's that worked out for you, Rusty? You know, it's still so difficult to measure. It's, it's so hard. <laughs> Over 50% of my desktops yes. are running. <laughs> so, extrapolating that, it's all good. And in, yeah. in who, who is running a Linux desktop? On your desktop or laptop yeah. or Thank you. excellent. Yeah. And on smartphones, we are 80%. Right. <laughs> so, no. Yep. Right. Answered. Here you go. <laughs> Okay, something slightly different from the previous ones. Uh, those of us of a certain age um, got into computing mostly, I think, from the old 8-bit computers, and I remember like there were picture books for kids that taught advanced basic and even machine language. Now, the, the world's a different place now, and there doesn't seem to be anything like that. Some people are trying, like, you know, with Raspberry Pi or anything, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on getting the younger generations into our community, because it's all about learning software literacy and understanding how... Um, our computers work and it doesn't seem to be there's much encouragement for uh, the younger ones to join our community and basically fill the ranks as we sort of age. So by younger ones you mean under 30? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat, yes. I wish I had the answer to that because I've got three kids and none of them seem to be interested in technology except as users. Well, that's not true, but at least in computers in the sense I'm interested in computers. And uh, I think part of the problem is there's the technology of today is so complicated that for somebody like me who is interested in kernels, it used to be easy to get in at, at the hardware level. And that's simply not true in computers anymore. Uh, and the world has moved on and we're old farts for a reason. Uh, that said, it's much easier to get involved in many other ways. Right? Maybe you're not into computers and you're into the whole 3D printing thing. Uh, and maybe you're into doing these 
user application things, and they're way easier to do than they used to be. So I, I, I don't have an answer. I, at, at the same time, I don't really worry. It's not the same thing anymore. There's no point in teaching everybody machine language or basic or something like that. I, uh, I'm looking at most young people tend to be pretty tech savvy. Right, so I wouldn't really worry. They may not be kernel tech savvy, but we don't need everybody to do that. Yeah, I think there's also this immense trend that um, we've been aware of, and in fact, there have been some talks around edges of this uh, here at this conference, and that's towards um, accessibility of microcontroller platforms and other places where um, kids are, are really enthusiastic because they see a direct connection between little bits of programming and action that affects the real world. Um, I discovered a really long time ago, well before I had kids of my own, and, and it's something that I've enjoyed playing with them with, that, um, you know, on some level, computers are kind of boring. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do with them, and my kids are certainly far more literate and quick to go, you know, grab a computer to do something than even I am sometimes. But um, there's this immense uh, sort of feedback loop thing that works well if you even get to the point where they're turning an LED on or off or uh, getting a servo to move. Or So my strong suggestion, if you've got kids or, or you're trying to figure out how to get younger people enthusiastic, is look for places where there's an intersection between simple computing devices and real world effects and feedback loops. And you know, if they figure out how to you know, write a little bit of code in an Arduino thing or something, then they might end up thinking trying to do kernel development is interesting someday. I'm not sure why they would, but. Hi, I'm Simon. Uh, my question is, where do you see System D being in the next five years? Is it just the new? Is it just the new UDEV or maybe DevFS? Go. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why the system D question comes up because I don't even care. I, I, I'm a system D user and I have not been involved in any of those arguments at all that I know of, uh, apart from not liking one particular person. Um, and I'm pretty sure B. Dale doesn't want to take that question. So I use system D. Most of you probably do use system D. Yeah. It's all good. I, I didn't care either until yesterday. Apparently, they've got masquerading support. and. Um, I looked at the code, the, the patch that actually put that in. Um, they don't fork out to IP tables because that would be slow, so they use it directly. And actually, the code looked fairly sane. So, you know, as long as the code's pretty good, it's. I don't really understand what all the fuss is about. When you try to. So just to be clear, the real reason I don't want to take that question is I don't try to predict five years in the future about much of anything. Um, and uh, you know, the events in my life in the last couple of years have made it clear that trying to predict too far into the future is, is you know, uh, that way lies madness. Um, part of the reason that I ended up taking the decision that I made in the whole Debian system D thing is that it seemed to be the place where there was the most enthusiasm, activity, and good stuff being worked on for the future. Um, and one of the reasons that we worked hard to constrain the actual decision that we made in the Debian project to the next stable release cycle is we have no idea what will be the hot, shiny, right thing to be using another release cycle later. Um, my anticipation is that people will continue to poke at it and do good things, and, and hopefully it ends up being, you know, code that we're all okay with. Okay, my question is for Linus. Um, Linus, when you didn't like the current version control, you wrote Git, and you didn't like you're di you didn't find a good dive log, so you wrote your own dive log. What are you working on now that is not on the kernel? Are you hacking on something nice? Um, I'm not. Uh, honestly, I'm a lazy person, which is li why I like open source. I get all these people to do all my job work for me. So I, don't, I 
don't really want to have other projects. What I want to do is just sit, sit on a beach and sip a foofy drink and just let you guys do the work. <laughs> and, and the fact that then occasionally I've had to say, okay, in order to be lazy for the next five years, I have to do something. Uh, that's why right now, um, the thing I've always cared about has been the kernel. And uh, right now, knock wood or something, uh, the, the kernel development process seems to be working really well and we don't have any huge looming concerns and I hope I'm not wrong about that. Uh, so, so we seem to have found a model that is working, is getting us where we want to go and, uh, and it, we're, I'm coasting. Well, right now I'm coasting. Then the merge window comes along and it gets crazy for a few weeks again. But um, So I don't have any projects I'm working on. Um, I hope to next week work on my dive log thing that I started but I gave up way. But that's, even that hope is more like, I hope things work so well that I don't need to. Thank you. A wee bit of a heretical question here. I was just reading the other day about this new machine, the machine that will have maybe petabytes of Memorista so you don't have files uh, because everything permanent and memory are the same thing. Uh, therefore, uh, Linux can't handle it. You need a much better offering system that doesn't deal with files but deals with memory structures. Uh, I wonder what you have to say about that, Linus. Call me when it's you want to talk. So, um, a well known member of our community has just rejoined HP in order to work on the Linux port to the machine. Uh, the, the one thing that might be worth, I mean, if Keith wants to come up and speak, no. but I don't think he does. Uh, one thing that might be worth mentioning is even when you have persistent memory and you can imagine a world where everything is in RAM and it never goes away that won't necessarily really change things as much as some people say, because you will still want to have a file system just to organize this thing. Persistence also means that, I mean, one of the advantage of RAM, and it goes away, is that you do something and then you throw it away. And that means you don't have to manage it as much, because it, it, the fact that it's ephemeral means that it, it's also something you don't need to care about long term. Um, if you have persistent RAM or RAM uh, memristors or any other kind of model, you will still need to have a file system just to have a way to organize these things that stay around for years and years. So it won't change that. It will change the details in the file system. When you have byte addressability, you can do things that you can't do with disks. But we already see that with SSDs that just the performance uh, differences mean that you do different things in file systems than you used to do 20 years ago or 50 years ago. So on some level, one of the things I would suggest is that what's really interesting about the machine is that the intersection of a couple of parallel long-term technology <coughs> development trends that are going to hit the market at about the same time are going to give us the opportunity sort of all at once to throw more existing assumptions up in the air possibly bat them completely out the window than normally happens when we're watching sort of the steady evolution of technologies. Lynch is absolutely right. The introduction of SSDs changed the way we think about performance in a storage subsystem, right? I mean, you know, gone are the days when, you know, elevator algorithms for managing, you know, block transfer uh, sequencing were fundamental to being able to get any kind of useful performance out of a storage sub subsystem at all. But the, 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 the uh, the needs, the concerns, the pinch points just move. It'll be different, but it won't be, it's not like the whole world magically gets simpler. Suspend and resume is going to be really fast. <laughs> There's been so many technical questions, I want to ask a meta question instead. So you can be purely opinionistic. Um, 
Given that Australia and New Zealand technically share the same airspace, do you think that they should come together and form a combined space agency, given that we're the only G20 nation without one? Well, I'll take that one. You should take that one. Yeah, I mean, we technically all share the same airspace, right? <laughs> And, and it's expensive, and I think we all need to get together to really go into space. I'm really the wrong person to ask of all the people in this room. I'm probably pretty low down on the list to really answer that question. Right. Um, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So we already had a question about the machine and Linux++ Plus Plus and things like that. Do you think there'll be any innovation in hardware in the next few years where the Linux kernel possibly couldn't make the transition very quickly? And what do you think the implications will be for all of us and all of our work as a whole if Linux loses the dominance it's achieved over the past decades? I wouldn't lose sleep over it. Uh, yeah, and I really don't lose sleep over it. In fact, I think in the computer industry in general, the big question is not what happens to software in the next few years, but what happens to hardware and when scaling stops. And it's not happening in a few years, but it's happening in 10, and it's getting much more gradual, and maybe somebody will come up with something really radically new, and there are people who argue that, hey, We've been saying that scaling will stop for the last 50 years, and it hasn't stopped for the last 50 years. It will stop. People who believe in quantum computers are. Before or after the year? <laughs> is it going to stop before or after the year of the Linux desktop? <laughs> you know what? I really think what happened is the this, this Linux desktop scaled down, and now we have it in our pockets. So that, but, but we're really at the point where in 10 years, uh, five nanometers, that's not a lot of atoms. And the whole computer industry, I mean software too, don't get me wrong, but the whole computer industry has for a long time lived on the notion that the computer five years from now will be fundamentally different and faster. What happens when that's not true on a chip level anymore? You can still improve, right? You can do clever things and you can improve, but it's not going to be the same kind of improvement. And we've seen some of it already, but it's going to get much worse. And that will impact software too, but I think it will impact the hardware people much, much more. And uh, that's going to be interesting in 10 to 15 years, what happens when... Mm. So, I might mention there was a similar question actually in 2003 to that, which I, I think uh, is worth mentioning at this point. There was a question about um, uh, somebody in the audience said that in uh, that 20 years before, uh, so 1983, they had a computer on their desk that could uh, write letters uh, to their mum and print. And now, you know, 20 years later, 2003, they had a computer on their desk that could write letters to their mum and print. You know, what's changed in that 20 years? Now, the answer at the time from Bedale actually was that it got slower. <laughs> um, and that's what's changed. But um, I asked a couple of people about that before this, and they and I said, well, what's changed in the last, you know, 12 years? And uh, the answer from several people was, it's got faster again. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't print. <laughs> a couple of weeks, was it two or three weeks ago, there was this big surprise uh, that it turned out that many uh, kernel developers don't know how memory allo allocation works. Um, I think LW.net uh, wrote uh, too small to fail, that problem. Uh, so. I thought to myself then, well, 10, 15 years ago, the answer to that problem would probably be to have RDFM. The question today, I would ask which file manual we should have read. Do you think that documentation of the kernel is appropriate? Uh, do you have any idea how to improve that? <laughs> well, I clearly have no idea how to improve documentation in the kernel. This is where um, others sometimes step up and do a great job of explaining small details. At the same time, 
There was a talk yesterday about how uh, programming should be provably correct and it's, it would be a great thing if we could prove correctness and that we all suck at it and, and, and I don't take that approach. I'm more of a touchy-feely guy. <laughs> I actually, I believe in biological processes and I believe in evolution and I believe in all these making mistakes and trying and uh, we don't have documentation for how humans work but humans work really really well except when they break down uh, and uh, I actually think we're at the stage and we have been at the stage in kernel development and in a lot of technology where nobody really understands everything that's going on. The VM is complicated. Deal with it and just realize that the answer to that is not to make the VM simpler because the VM is complicated for a reason. It's doing all these crazy things and a lot of them are heuristics. They don't have hard reasons for it. There often is no this is what you need to do. This is the correct answer. A lot of the time it's like we want to go in roughly that direction and uh, we don't even know how to get there, but if we do this, most of the time it works. That's how a lot of real problems in real life are. And uh, that is hard to document when there is no real answer. And uh, we should continue to document the big rules. We should continue to document the details like uh, how memory ordering works, which was another subject that came up to yesterday, but that still will never be in the situation where we can give a spec for the kernel. And I don't think we should even try. We should, we should just realize that, okay, life is complex and we do the best we can and we need to have smart people, but we also need to have a lot of people who test, a lot of people who are willing to accept that I don't know what the solution is, but I know what is better than what we do today in this area. And if you continue to do that, this is how biological systems work, and it's a provably working process. It doesn't get you to the perfect end result, but it gets you to something that works better than anything else we've ever seen. So, Hang on, go to chop a chop. <laughs> so just to follow but up on did that. Did anyone else want to uh, chime in on that? Yeah. On that? So um, when I wrote, uh, wrote NetFilter the first time, I actually wrote a hacking how-to that had all those details on how it all worked and how you could extend it and everything else. And the first time I received a major patch, I was really excited. The patch was great. And I said, what did you think of the hacking how-to? And of course, he said, what how-to? <laughs> And so the lack of documentation does provide a filter for contributions. Um, That's terrible. <laughs> it's, it's, it's terrible, but it's true because they have to read the code anyway because the documentation will lie. So why not skip the first point and make them read the code immediately because they'll have to deal with it. Um, so in practice, I found that effort put into documentation in the kernel uh, was not paid back. Uh, so I, I actually disagree. I mean, we have areas where we document uh, small details like locking rules and, and these kinds of very specific and very targeted areas. We do need to have documentation because they are, they are things that people can't keep in mind and they're kind of big enough picture that you can't look at one piece of code and see what you should do. So we do need documentation, but I, I think the argument is documentation is not a panacea. It doesn't solve everything. It, it's not always the answer. Um. Um, I, I noticed Tridge has not been answering a lot of questions. You've been doing a lot of moderating and throwing out chuppa chup, so I'll crack out an old chestnut that everyone can, can answer. Um, current desktops, GNOME you know, 2, 3, KDE, Emacs. Oh. <laughs> what do we run? Yeah. All right, that's okay. That's um, checked from time to time and changes from time to time. Okay, anyone want to start? 
Yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, this is my badge, you know, Emacs, Git, I run uh, Ubuntu Trusty, um, and I've switched between a number of different, uh, you know, window managers, um, but uh, and actually, you know, a lot of my work is on embedded systems these days, so uh, most of the time my desktop is actually GNU Screen. Um, and running GNU Screen on a system, that often the systems are on another continent. And so, really, the closest thing to a desktop I have at the moment is GNU Screen. Uh, Debian Unstable, XFCE4, and a lot of terminal windows. Um, I'm on Fedora 21 right now. Um, I'm actually known for being a GNOME hater. I don't like some of the development models they have, but I, I'm a GNOME 3 user with a couple of extensions to fix what I thought were big failures. And I don't believe in Emacs or VI, so. <laughs> I use this one editor that nobody sane would ever use, but it's what I grew up with, so. I just fixed that a bug where it would crash if you had a big screen and more than 128 lines on the screen. <laughs> that, that's the kind of crap I run. <laughs> I run stock Ubuntu on my desktop, uh, but my build machine is Arch, and, um, uh, and the only window manager that has is when I SSH in SSH-X, uh, otherwise it's all text. So. Uh, I'm Dave Lane. Um, just have a question, this probably applies to all of you, but um, I guess primarily for, for Linus in this case. Um, do you all see uh, yourselves being, at some point in your leadership roles, usurped by a computer? Uh, and if so, what, what kernel will it be running? <laughs> Are you, in your leadership role, going to have that role usurped by a computer? And if so, which kernel will it be running? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Equal life. I don't know. Will it be, <laughs> will it be heard? I th yeah, I think my mind will be going before that happens, but the argument there is when that happens, and I don't know. I think there is actually a, a partly serious answer one can give to that, that question. It, it uh, harks back a little bit to some of the social interactions. Something I've noticed in recent times is processes for doing software development are becoming more mechanised. And um, so the uh, so often these days, you know, you, you're on um, you know GitHub or you know Gitorious or whatever, and it's like a, it's a pull request, and it's just a patch, and you respond there. There's less social interaction. You you, you might as well be you know talking to a computer because it is getting more and more mechanised that process. And I think that feeds into you know I've never seen um, any you know really heated discussions in a pull request chat. Um, and uh, so it is sort of moving to be a more mechanized process and, you know, being more computerized in a way. So I, if I end up being replaced by a computer, I don't actually sort of care on some level as long as it's running free software. Yeah. Um, hey, um, my name's Laura Bell. It's actually my first time at LCA. Cool. Um, security specialist. Um, while uh, security bugs have always historically been found in Linux and open source products, in the last 12 months, the way they have reached the world through mainstream media has changed dramatically. Um, and you know, our bash bugs of the last 12 months have kind of changed the way most people who don't think about security interact. Um, what are your predictions for security in the open source Linux space for the next 12 months? And which areas of code if you were going to go and look at one right now for vulnerability research, which would you start with? <laughs> Bitcoin. <laughs> I mean, if you knew which piece of code to look at for security issues, we wouldn't have security issues. Uh, it's going to be something very obscure and stupid, and it's going to be obvious in hindsight, and people will say, how did we ever miss that? And 
that's what it's always going to be. Uh, the security is just a hard problem. And, well, uh, well, I think you're absolutely right, and and this falls into another one of those. I'm certainly not going to try and be very predictive categories. I'm really pleased that at least part of the response to this sort of escalation or change in the way things are being reported and talked about over the last year or so is that there are some activities attempting to sort of shine more light on, put more resources on some of the core elements of technology that we all depend on. I'm referring, of course, to things like the Linux Foundation Core Infrastructure Initiative and so on. Uh, I don't actually immediately know sort of how that's going, but the idea that we are at least trying to figure out how to get more eyeballs on some of the things that we all agree are some of the most important elements of code in our infrastructure and that we found the corporate members of our extended community willing to ante up to help make that happen is, is pretty cool and, and I hope that's a good step. There's another thing that's been going on which I find personally very satisfying which is that people are less willing sometimes to kind of brush the problem under the mat and leave it up to vendors and have disclosure like infinitely long disclosure times. I'm a huge believer in in just disclosing still somewhat responsibly but security problems need to be made public and uh, there are people who argue and have argued for decades that you never want to talk about security problems because that only helps the, uh, the, the black hats and the fact is that I, I think you absolutely need to report them and you need to report them in a reasonable time frame or reasonable for the kernel security list is admittedly five working days which some people think is a bit extreme uh, and, and in other projects it might be a month or a couple of months but that's still much better than the years and years of silence which we used to have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, we're going to need to, to wrap it up there. Um, so I'm going to get the last question, ah, which yeah. is a real privilege as, as one of the organising team. As of now, as of today, and perhaps looking forward a little bit, what do you feel is your biggest legacy to the open source movement? That posting about the first release of Linux, or the momentum that caused you to release Git? or something else? Um, me personally, um, the quite yeah. I, I actually think one of the things that I, uh, Linux has been really good at, and I'm, and this is going to raise a few hackles, right? <laughs> I, I like open source, and I like this whole working to that, together with commercial companies and this whole notion that you don't need to vilify people who also do closed source. So for me personally, one of the big things I'm happy about is that I was part of the group, I mean, and Linux was a big example for the group who, who tried to take and now, this is when Tridge will stand up and give the other answer, who try to take this very uh, you, or us against the world approach of free software and made it more open. Not just in name, but also in being acceptable to people who don't necessarily believe in our values, but believe that our model is better. And, uh, and that's to me something that, that L Linux was really instrumental in. At the same time, I'm really happy about Git too, because I think Git has spread more than, than the kernel in some respects. And, and maybe I'll be remembered more for Git than Linux. We'll see. <laughs> if, I, if I would answer that on his behalf, I think that the thing I think the long lens of history might find the most important is how both of those projects have positively impacted this notion that uh, all of us as humankind working together collaboratively leads to better results than when we're all sort of hiding in separate corners and fighting and competing.
So uh, we need to wrap up there, but it's been a, a fantastic session. And uh, do you think that uh, our panel has earned a chuppa chup? -a -chup? <laughs> <laughs>